Now for our first session, security and privacy considerations and application development with pre presenter Rich Antonow. Rich is a technical specialist role for security and identity. He supports accounts with all things security as it relates to cloud and on-premise identities. User synchronization, identity protection, data application device, threat protection, advanced EDR dash XDR solutions. Rich has been with Microsoft for five years, primarily covering the Western region, including states of Alaska and Hawaii. He resides in Phoenix, Arizona. I do want to remind you all that you have a question, a security and privacy question you have to answer uh, for part of your technical review. The reason this, this uh, presentation will be so vital to you, it'll give you an idea of how to answer that 300 uh, question, uh, 300 question answer. Remember this year, it, it, we have a special field on DevPost, so you don't have to figure out where to put it this year. So look for that question, make sure your, your 300 word answer is in there. And now, now for Rich, so that he can help you uh, answer that question. So Rich, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna let you take over the screen. All right, and um, kind of a uh, order. Our individual, uh, sorry, our members able to speak up directly. I, I make these interactive and I'd like to make sure that, you know, we can keep people engaged. Are they able to uh, speak up directly or uh, would they go into the chat window when I, when I start asking some questions? Here's, this is what I'm gonna suggest. So everybody on this call, feel free to turn on your camera, Turn on your mic, ask Rich a question. He's saying he likes interactive. Um, however, if you're shy and you don't wanna do that, uh, Rich, uh, Sheila and I will monitor the chat. And when we see a question, we will ask it for the person. Uh, if, you, if you're okay with us interrupting your session when we see a question, yes. Sheila. Yeah, okay. absolutely, please okay, do. Okay, so, so he, wants you, he wants you to interrupt him while he's in his session. So feel free to do that, attendees. And then if you don't, if you're a little shy, put it in the chat box and then we'll interrupt him for you. <laughs> My fave. Okay. This is this is is your time. I'm here to to present to you and be able to kind of um, set what are what's going on out there in the world and um, my background, let me give you a little bit more of my background. So by the way, I've now been here with six years. Uh, I presented last year as well. Um my background, my degree is in computer sciences, so um, I do have a technical uh, degree in code writing, but the reality is I'm a security technical specialist, so I don't, I don't get to write code. So I'm going to be presenting this from the security perspective of how we protect um, environments. What do you need to take into account? I will give you some, some specific security um, uh, code writing uh, e examples and information. But like I said, as we go through, if there are questions, uh, please feel free to speak up. Makes the day go by much nicer and uh, mahalo and greetings from Arizona. Beautiful day out today. Let's see if we can get this to change. There we go. All right, how do I close this out of the main screen? Can I get that out of there? I can't. Sorry, team. I'm trying to find out if I can get that off of there. I guess I'm going to leave it. All right. So let's let's start out with the uh, threat landscape. Microsoft, as a uh, a global service, we see trillions of signals a day, trillions. And when we take a snapshot of one minute, and I apologize, I don't know how to move this off of here, if there's a way to do that. Is that this? Oh. Ah, there we go. Okay, a, um, when we look at a one minute snapshot, just one minute of a day, what are we seeing out there? So in other words, how big is the threat? Within one minute, globally, so not any particular customer, 34,740 password attacks. 1,900 IoT, uh, information, uh, uh, Internet of Things based attacks. 19 denial of service attacks. Now this one, I 
actually think this is suspicious. I'm sure this is much higher, but um, it's the reporting. Seven phishing attacks every minute. I probably get that in my email box every minute. Um, one SQL injection. The idea is there's a huge amount of activity going on out there. So again, why did the show up? So what are hackers going after? If you think about it as an individual, when, um, when there's something like a phishing attack taking place, what are, the, what, are, what, are, um, what are the bad actors going after? What are the threats going after? Let's make this interactive. Somebody uh, wanna, wanna be brave and speak up? What are the bad actors trying to get? Their information. So uh, uh, true, to be more specific, if they're, if they're targeting you um, as an individual with a phishing attack, they're trying to get your information, right? They're trying to get information um, about you, your username, your password, any, any identifiable information that they can leverage. They can do things like, mm, I don't know, open credit card in, um, in, in your name, uh, which would now be theirs. Um, take out loans, uh, maybe get to your data, get to your email and be able to do stuff with it. Now compare and contrast that with a phishing attack when you're working for an organization and you're, you're in this case, code writing, you're writing applications for an organization and you need to be part of the big picture of how do we protect everything. Now what is that phishing attempt looking for? The phishing attempt now is looking for um, information not about the user, they're trying to get that information so that they can leverage that to get into the organization, ultimately, they're trying to get to data. So um, on an individual uh, level, they're going after your personal information. And at an organizational level, they're going after your data. And the way that happens is they uh, initially start with a, typically it's something like a phishing attempt, which I'll discuss here in just a minute. Um, then they'll move over into what we call lateral movement, which is basically saying, hey, I, uh, I compromised Rich Antonow's um, email or um, username and password, but he's just Joe Nobody. He doesn't have any rights to anything. So now, um, now that I'm the bad actor and I have that information, I can log in and get into the environment. Now I need to be able to do um, a, a lateral movement, try to find another account that I can get to that I can leverage that does have permissions so that I can then um, do some type of a compromise um, getting escalated permissions. Ultimately, what am I looking for? Somebody with those God rights, those domain admin, domain admin level uh, permissions. And then ultimately take that information and do something with it. Now it's down to, depending upon who the bad, bad actor is, what they're trying to do and um, what power they've gained. It could be something like, um, directly, uh, it could be corporate espionage. You're trying to get information about your secret cookie recipe um, so that they can make better cookies than you can. Maybe they're trying to take you out of business. They're gonna try to damage your data or take your systems down or, or a power grid, take a power grid down. Or it could be um, something like ransomware where they're going to basically take a copy of your data, probably save it offline. Then they're gonna encrypt your data so that you as an organization so that um, you now have to pay them to get your data back. But worse, because they saved that data before they encrypted your data, now once you pay them to get the data back, they're probably going to go, by the way, now you're going to pay us again, or we're going to release this data um, to the public, which might have information there that you don't want the public to see. So pretty nefarious. So if we take a quick look, and again, these are all from the, um, the security threat side right now. This has nothing to do directly with code, but what you need to be thinking about as a good code developer and a member of that organization is, how do I continue on and leverage um, uh, what I am doing to best protect? So when we look at some of the the most common vulnerabilities, those entryways to how does a bad actor get in, now I do want you to think about your code and how you're allowing um, uh, users to initially get to that. 
So we have to be able to protect user. Now, quite frankly, the lowest level, the, the, the target is always the individual, the human, because, well, we're stupid and we do stupid things. You know, come on, don't we all really want to see that dancing cat video, right? So people are going to click on links that we know they shouldn't, or we get overwhelmed with email and, and well, it kind of looks like Joe, or, well, I was waiting for that package from FedEx, and now they're saying the date's changed. Oh my gosh, I better click on that link to see uh, what the new date is without really paying attention that, you know, FedEx is spelled wrong, right? So we all, we all potentially do that. Some are better than others. I'm, you know, I'm not perfect either, but I'm pretty good at catching them. So usually it's come some type of a phishing and I'll define that a little bit better uh, in, a, in a bit. And then there's, there's actual attempts uh, or processes that are used directly against all user objects, those things are called like brute force password attacks or password spray attacks. That's um, a brute force attack is basically where, let's say uh, somebody goes onto LinkedIn, bad actor goes onto LinkedIn, they identify for a company who the executives are for that company. And they purposely wanna try to break in as those individuals. So they're gonna use that username, which is not hard to find. And then they're going to try to blast a bunch of passwords um, against that username to try to um, gain access. Those are called brute force. And then password spray is, think of it like it sounds, spray. We're going to, we're going to take this same password and we're going to stuff it across a thousand user accounts. Somebody in there probably used password one, two, three, right? That's what those are. And then the other thing that you always have to take into account, and again, this is where you're going to come in known vulnerabilities. You should expect that if you if your future is to be a code developer, you must keep up on um, all the latest um, vulnerabilities. And as new threats are found out in the wild and reported, you really should um, keep up on those and know what those vulnerabilities are and how they might affect whatever code or whatever application you're responsible for. Um, Microsoft uh, is the A number one target of all um, bad actors and threats. Uh, we are constantly under attack because of the sheer volume of information we contain, the sheer number of devices that are that are um, managed, and the fact that you know we've got so many applications out there, so many operating systems out there. So is it a surprise to me that um, however often they happen, there'll be some new code vulnerability that is discovered? No. When you've got millions and millions and millions of lines of code in an operating system or an application, is it reasonable to think that it can be absolutely 100% perfect out of the gate? Um, we try. We really do. It goes through a lot of regression testing, but there's a lot of smart people out there that can figure out really creative ways to get around these. Well, great. So they're identified. We now, uh, we, Microsoft, will now as quickly as possible respond to that, patch it. You have to be aware that that uh, vulnerability exists and take that into account in your code development to make sure that you accommodate that. So if it's a known vulnerability, you either have to work around it or realize that Microsoft is going to shut off that, that particular capability. And if you're using that as part of your function or so on, um, that might not work out there. And then as part of a breach, you know, once the, once the bad actor gets in, then they're gonna be basically rooting around. Here's a stat for you. You may or may not have heard this. What Microsoft and uh, basically MITRE and Fortinet have determined is that when a bad actor, that's a threat, has been discovered using tools, however that method is, in your environment, that bad actor has been rooting around in your environment for an average of 200 days. So if you think in general, you know, the, 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 the low level just gonna go in, try to grab some data and, and make some money, you know, a quick hit. Yeah, they're out there, but if they're truly uh, good at what they do, they're gonna get into your organization. Uh, I hope they don't, but if they get into your organization, they're not just gonna immediately do something. They're gonna root around. They're gonna watch what happens. They're going to start looking at the interactivity between the applications, the databases, the users, what protocols are being used, what protocols aren't being used. Um, are we using uh, certificates for those? Where's the root certificate? You know, 
Who communicates with whom? What applications communicate with other applications? They're going to build a lot of information around that. And at a certain point when they feel they have enough and they determine what their, um, their ultimate goal is, that's when that the, the quote unquote attack will actually happen. And like I said, they are going to do everything they can to try to gain access to resources that have permissions to things above Joe Nobody. You know, us, us normal users that log in and we get email and other, other things, I don't have any access to any specific code within Microsoft. I'm not in that, that division. So if they, if they were ever able to um, take advantage of my account, they're not going to get to all that level. But I routinely interact with other people on the program team. So what if they were to hijack some of that information and now know who's on the program team? Well, those people probably do have access. So now they become a target. Maybe they're going to send a message from me to one of those members saying, hey, Joe, I'm having issue with a, uh, a particular customer. They sent me a um, um, a, an Active Directory wrap of, of their environment that has been that. Uh, can you take a look at this? Unbeknownst, it didn't. Although it might appear to come from me, it's not coming from me. It's coming from the bad actor under my name, and that contains a malware that um, maybe allows them to do something like pass the hash, pass the ticket, grabbing that information. So that's how a lot of these um, these actually take effect. And then once that has taken effect. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the individuals uh, or the bad actor being able to, you know, do everything from uh, ransomware to uh, taking information, deleting your backups. By the way, that's really common. Everybody seems to think, well, gee, when they get ransomware, why don't they, uh, why don't they just restore? I guarantee after, after a bad actor gets in your environment and they add a few back doors in case they get caught, they still want a way to get back in. It's like, okay, great, I got kicked out. Oh, you caught me. No, what? No problem. I'm going to wait two weeks. I'm going to come in a different level than a path that I opened. They're going to delete your backups. They're going to delete the records. They're going to delete logs. So all these things are going to happen. Let me pause there initially for questions. Any questions so far, including if you, if you don't want to speak up, if you can put them in the chat window, then somebody can um, speak up for you. Okay. Now. This time I do want you to speak up. What is the number one vector for bad actors to get into the environment? Any environment, what is it? No one? Okay. The number Wait, one- you mean like, Maybe like passwords, is that? Bingo, you win the prize, yes, passwords. Giving, uh, getting a user's password, either because the user made the password super simple, the, uh, the user is using a very common password, maybe they, they, um, they didn't make any type of uh, complexity the password, or they just literally gave it up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's passwords. Let's have a little fun. So this is, I'm gonna show you a video. This is a little bit older video, but um, I, think, I think it'll kind of prove out the point. You know, we've been hearing a lot about cybersecurity lately, largely because of what happened to Sony. Companies and individuals are more concerned about the safety and privacy of their information than ever. President Obama has unveiled a number of new proposals this week to crack down on hackers, and he plans to address this in the State of the Union speech on Tuesday. And it's great that the government is working on this, but the truth of the matter is we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves. You know, the most popular password in the United States is password one, two, three. And as long as we're, as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. But, and so you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. 
And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, six, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G-E-M-M-A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like so what, like... Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the important thing is he le they learned a uh, <laughs> terrible lesson. Hi, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. Did you know there... Okay. So, you'd like to think that's comedy, but the reality is that actually happens. Right? Can, Rich, can I add something here? Absolutely. So, uh, for everybody listening, um, there's a, a online YouTube talk where the guy talks about... Uh, the questionnaires online, mm -hmm. they ask things like, what's your pet name? What was your first street? What high school did you graduate? What year? There's these like really cool, like, you know, get to know me better hat, um, questionnaires. Please don't use those. Those are probably bad actors trying to get your details. So Thank I'll just add you. that. Yeah. You were, uh, uh, you, I couldn't have teed that up better. That's exactly where I was going to go. And so think of it. I, I I know Sorry, I've but... personally seen them. I, 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 I'd be willing to bet, given the audience, you've all seen it. If you've been on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, um, you get those surveys that she's talking about. Hey, how many of these can you answer? Or, or the, these are my favorite things. And it's like, you know, what's all you're doing is you're giving the bad actors more and more and more and more and more information about you. Um, here's, here's an example. Um, MFA, multi-factor authentication, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later too. MFA is a really great thing, and organizations go, ah, you know, we're, we're, we're protecting ourselves, we're using MFA, and of course, now I'm, you know, the, the security geek going like, oh, good, everybody? Well, yeah, most of them, uh, we've got some that don't, it's like, okay, so what if the bad actor picks the ones that didn't? Well, we monitor that. I says, okay, so so you're using it. What what form factor are you using? Oh, we're using uh, we're using SMS text. I said, so basically, when somebody when somebody um, gets an MFA request, it's going to go to their phone. Yeah. Do you know how easy it is for a bad actor? I could probably do it in a half hour. How easy it is for a bad actor to um, mitigate that? Here's all it takes. All I got to do is know who I'm going after. I'm going to go to your Facebook profile or your LinkedIn or or somewhere in there. I'm pretty sure I could find your mobile number. Can we assume that if you uh, have MFA set up, you have it set up to your mobile phone because after all, your home phone doesn't accept SMS text, right? So I got your mobile number. So I know what number that MFA is going to go to. Hmm, what shall I do with that? Well, I got a whole desk full of either old phones or phones that have been stolen. Okay, I don't, but the bad actor will. Um, I can easily just go get a SIM card. And guess what? I can clone your phone number, put it on that SIM card, put the SIM card in my phone, turn on that phone. And now if I, um, if I am able to successfully breach the user's username password and it sends that, um, that SMS text, guess who gets the code? I do. So now I have your username password and I just bypassed MFA. Why? Because you put it out there in the wild, okay? Um, now, the, the bad news, I, we just told you that. Don't rush out and go delete everything. 
this is the internet. <laughs> it's not going to work. You've already put it out there. So just resist the temptation to give away more and more and more information. Or if you have some fun, do like I do. Lie about it. Oh, my grandmother's name is Herbert. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, let me hide this little guy again. So, Microsoft, um, as a global uh, global service provider, uh, we invest. Get this now. We invest currently over two billion dollars a year, specifically for security. Um, year before last, um, Satya, our CEO, um, he he uh, went before Congress, and he vowed that Microsoft will ramp that up to. Five billion dollars a year, specifically on security. We do a huge amount. So when you look at some of the things that Microsoft um, is doing here, take that same one. Take that same one-minute snapshot. That same one-minute snapshot. We are basically protecting almost sixty-one thousand emails being uh, being blocked. Um, identity theft. Fifty-eight thousand. Those brute force uh, password attacks, 48,000, and then malware threats. So quite a bit. Let's go back to phishing. And again, I wanna set the, the understanding that why am I telling you these things when this is about secure code? In order for you to do what you need to do, you need to know what the threats are. This is the number one threat, phishing. So you need to understand how these things happen, um, what the threat vectors are, how they get in, and then I'm going to be talking about, you know, some of the ways to mitigate that. All right. How many of you knew that there were more than one phishing type? There's a lot of them. These are six of the most common. The two you might have heard the most are uh, spear phishing and whaling. So in regular email uh, phishing, that's where they basically just send out um, messages. For those of you old enough, I kind of use the analogy, they're like Fritos, send all the emails you want, we'll make more, right? What does it actually cost to send the bad, or for the bad actor to send an email out to, I don't know, say a million people? I don't know, three cents, right? Are a million people going to be dumb enough to click on a, a, a bad phishing attempt link? Absolutely not. Can I guarantee that out of that million that went out, a thousand are going to do it. I feel pretty confident that the ratio sounds about right. They're going to get about a thousand people to click on that. So you can see the numbers are already against you know us um, us not the bad actor. So email by uh, for sure. Spear phishing is where they're basically um, highly highly targeted. Um, they're going after a large group of very specific individuals. Remember I mentioned things like, hey, I'm going to go into LinkedIn. I'm going to pick an organization that I want to try to break into, and I'm going to go find who all the leaders are of there, and then I'm going to follow those paths down and see who they communicate with, and I'm going to send emails to them. How am I going to get those? Because <laughs> they're published there. Whaling. You know, whaling is basically looking for some of those big things. I'm not going to go into all of these, but the idea is these are all different uh, phishing attempts. All right, everybody ready for a little fun? This is an actual um, email that, that I received in my Hotmail. And being the good security guy that I am, I basically chuckled getting it. Can you spot five different things in this simple one? I did not make this up. I, I did get this just two days ago. Can anybody point out and, and just, Call them out when somebody when somebody sees them. If you have to put them in uh, chat, please do. But there's five different things that I caught, and there might even be another one in here. Anybody want to reach out? Give me one of them. The first thing I noticed is just the, the spacing in the in the first line. They forgot a space, um, so it's like it's all just one like in between the comma and hey, and then the R want to know. Okay, that, that could be. Um, now, truthfully, a lot of people um, may do that purposely, so that could be an indicator. All right, very well. What else? We have somebody typing in the email title, spacing looks weird. Um, spacing looks weird, okay, uh, probably true. 
the attachment bothers me. Okay. Uh, why does it bother you? Because attachments usually are things that people open and have bad stuff attached to it. <laughs> well, sure. Um, uh, uh, that that is definitely a true statement. What what about the attachment um, um, appears to be off to you? <clears throat> Anything? And, and again, I'm not putting anybody on the spot. This uh, no, is, I, I, just it's just, I, I, if there's an attachment, well, I can tell you, I can I like tell you other things that I'm seeing, but I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll let that up yeah. to other people. So. Yeah, I want this to be interactive. Come on, people. This, everybody, uh, I, I, I do this routinely, by the way, just so you know, um, when I get these type of things, I actually highlight all these and I send it out as a picture. I send it out to all my friends and say, hey, these are the things you should be looking for. I'm literally trying to train them. So I'm using this as a training exercise for you guys and having a little bit of fun. The uh, the numbers after Bill in the subject line and in the attachment are different. <laughs> Very good. Definitely have one of them. So up there, up there on the top, the subject line, Bill, what the heck, a Waku V, and then that doesn't match the attachment. Yep, definitely one of them. What else we got? Gmail? It's a Gmail account? That's yep. what somebody says, Stuart says. Absolutely. Uh, be, if, if I'm receiving a bill, I am almost certainly not receiving a bill from some Gmail, somebody with a Gmail. If it's a, if it's a bill, it should be somebody from an actual organization. So I would expect an email address of an actual organization. And okay. then the next one, uh, Bradley says there is no company or service listed. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, that that would that would be true. I could probably, I'll add that as a six. That's not even one of the five, but yes, absolutely. So we've only gotten one so far? Uh, you've got, uh, you've got the, um, the, the uh, title and the, the um, attachment don't match. You got the, uh, the Gmail name. Uh, insufficient. Got a couple more. Okay. How about the name, the A one ton now want to now. Yep, that's one of them. If this if this is truly somebody that I'm doing business with, that where did they get that from? Because my Outlook um, email is R W Antonow at Outlook. So all they did was they took my Outlook email and assumed that that first part was my actual first name, which of course it's not. So yes, they don't they don't know me. They 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 put that in. That's a huge flag for me. Yeah, I'll give you guys a hint. Do that. Colloquial language, hey. Uh, Stuart <laughs> also, also true. Says, hey, uh, uh, again, we're having fun with this, right? I'm going to give them bonus points for actually writing it in um, somewhat correct English. Yeah, uh, I was going to say <laughs> the English isn't yeah, too bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, a little polite here, but yeah, in general, the English is kind of there. Okay, tell you what, I'm going to give you a hint. Read, read the wording in the bottom. You're seeing the entire message, by the way. Oh, There's I just no spotted free number. I just responded, I just spotted the seventh one. Okay, uh, Ethan Ray says no toll-free number. There you go, that's one of the five. Yeah, using the toll-free number below. There is no toll-free number below. And then technical support sending you a bill. That's what I, I actually didn't even catch that the first time. <laughs> whoever, <laughs> whoever, <Aaron. laughs> yep, that's my number seven that I didn't even know about. Look, you guys even found some in there. And and uh, one more. I don't see it. This really so tell us, Rich. <laughs> sure. I guess going back that, to the attachment, at, the, oh, wait, wait, wait. the invoice number. There you go. He got it on the attachment, yeah. Yep, he got it. Look at the bill oh. number and look at the invoice number. Nowhere near the same. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 I missed that. But there I mean, these, these are all um, little little nuances. If only one of these in there, if only one of those instances were in there, you might've got away with it. But, you know, come on guys. If you're going to try to get somebody to click on it, do a little bit more due diligence. At least put in a fake phone number. Um, um, along that same lines, I had a friend of mine. Um, she called me two days ago because she knows I work for Microsoft. She goes, hey, I got an, I got an email from uh, so-and-so. 
because, or, uh, sorry, I got a pop up on my workstation that said, you know, you're infected with this Trojan virus. You need to call Microsoft services at this number. So mm -hmm. she did call them. And then they start out by asking her questions. Um, and then, you know, they wanted her name and everything else and her login information. She goes, oh, no. And I, and I said, yeah, I, I said, think, think about it. If anybody ever asked those type of things, that should really raise the hair on the hackles. Okay, so very good. And if I could add one more comment, uh, if you get a text message, I've been getting lots of text messages lately, yeah. uh, either about a bill, uh, 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 something I ordered, or, uh, and uh, click this link to confirm, or, hey, you, you, you're due $600 because a refund, anything like that. If you don't, particularly look at the phone number. Uh, yeah. That, that's going to be a very big indicator of whether or not that's somebody or something that really is legitimate. So yeah, um, to, thank you. All true. To wrap this up, you know, and 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 move on, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you my my general here's Rich's security advice. If you get a link to anything, and they provide a phone number in that mail, like or call you know we're from Bank of America, call us because your account's been been paused. Never call that phone number. That's that's been set up specifically. They, they have a call service that's going to act as if they're that. No. If 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 first of all, if you even have a Bank of America account, but if you uh, you go directly to your bank, you go to your login to your bank, and you go into there. And if you want to call customer service, you get the number from there. Never call the links. Uh, never call the numbers in a link. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about ransomware because this has to do with um, how you're going to be able to protect um, data. So, little statistic on the bottom there, 80% of ransomware attacks can be traced to common configuration errors in software, that's where you come in, and devices. So, ransomware, huge, huge problem. What does huge mean? Oh, I mean, look at this one down here. Look at the very bottom stat in the blue. 1.85, I, I did this for a healthcare organization that I had to uh, do a presentation for recently. 1.85 million is the average cost to recover from a ransomware attack. 66% of healthcare organizations were struck by ransomware in 2021. So if you're gonna go work for a large healthcare organization, you should be afraid. You should pay attention to what's going on. 61% of those organizations will pay the ransom. How crazy is that? And just like, just like real ransom, just because you pay the ransom, you are now trusting that the bad actor, uh, the, 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 the thief, the, the uh, organization that's doing this is actually gonna unlock your data. And a little statistic I saw um, in researching it, even if you pay the ransom and even if they actually unencrypt your data, statistically about 39% of that data is going to be corrupt and you probably can't recover it anyways. So you're paying full price for about 60% of your data. And I left this in here um, just because this is just a quick uh, going back to what I was saying where the phase A on the, the left and phase B on the right those bad actors, once they get in, they're gonna be rooting around quite a while. So when you look at um, your ability to protect um, data, this is where you have to look at where are you storing your data? How are you protecting the data? Who has access to the data? How is it being monitored? How is it being protected? Now, admittedly, you as a, if, if we take it that you're going to be writing code, you don't have primary responsibility pretty much for any of it. You do have responsibility, though, that let's say um, let's say your your um, part of the code writing is going to be checked in and checked out of a code vault. Well, that means you have to protect your user object, and you have to ensure that you're not um, you know um, uh, liable for any type of malware, ransomware in protection of your device and your account. And then uh, again, when we look at how these things actually take place, I'm not going to uh, drain this slide, uh, you know, 
um, speak to it too much, but this is basically how it always works. All right, now I'm gonna transition a little bit to um, some other information that's gonna be extremely relevant in your job. Let's start out with a couple of terms. How many of you ever heard of GDPR? I'm going to assume there's some virtual yeah. hands up. Yeah, it's like the cookie thing is mostly what it's known for, but. Yeah, so in general, I'll, I'll, I mean, I have it on the screen here, but I'll, I'll dumb it down a little bit. GDPR is actually a European regulation that was passed back in 2018. GDPR basically says the EU um, has said that people's personally identifiable information is personal and belongs to the individual, not to an organization, and it must be protected. And furthermore, if an individual says, I don't want you to keep or maintain my information any longer, um, they are under the legal responsibility to purge any and all data. So again, that that is incumbent upon you when you're gathering user information, storing it, however your application is going to function, you need to know where that data is going to be stored and how it's going to be stored. And the second line, but my application's in the US, why do I need to worry? Well, there's the answer there, because if you look at GDPR, it is not about where the, um, the uh, user uh, physically lives, it's where the data for that user object lives. So if you're going to be working for a multi, uh, multinational corporation and you're writing code and you're gathering information about a user and you're saving information about that user, um, AKA data, right? So when we're talking about data, data also includes the information about a user. We call that PII, personally identifiable information. It is incumbent upon you to know these things. Um, you'll, you'll find that you're gonna be, do, uh, be doing data mapping and so on, basically identifying through flow charts where data will flow, where it's going to be, uh, reside, how it's gonna be gathered, where it will be stored. So now you have to take into account, all right, well, not only do I have to protect it, but I have to provide a method that if, if an individual from France that used my system says, I need to have all my data removed, your application or your interface has to be intelligent enough to be able to go um, uh, allow that user to opt out and have their information removed. Another thing. I am sure all of you have heard of HIPAA. HIPAA is healthcare related, stands for uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. And basically HIPAA is any information relating to healthcare and your particular care um, for an individual has to be protected. Um, I guarantee all of you have dealt with that. Uh, I just had some uh, shoulder surgery and I can't tell you how many times I've had to sign a little HIPAA agreement saying, yes, I understand, uh, you know, this data and, you know, it will be protected and all that stuff. Um, all, all these have to do. And again, why is this important to you? Because these are legal requirements. These aren't, these aren't suggestions. There are really large fines for not protecting um, uh, HIPAA and PII related data for users. So you as an individual and as part of your team, you have responsibility for being able to um, protect that data, determine where it's going to be. And it gets even more complex than that. Let's say uh, when, you're, when you're working with your data, maybe in a particular table is all the usernames and a, uh, an account number provided uh, for them. In a different table is their healthcare records and a, um, a medical procedures that they've undergone and shots they've gotten. And maybe even a third table, there's information about their home address and, and their next of kin and, and whatever other information has been collected. You have to be able to, through your data mapping, you have to map how this data is accessible by each of those um, user objects and or the application and how it can be put together. Who can do queries and pull, do a join on all of that information? 
So you can see this is way more than, you know, I'm not just talking about, you know, writing functions and everything else. This is all about how is data accessed, who has access to the data, how can it be queried, how can the data be put together, and once that data is correlated, it now becomes PII. It has a whole nother protection. So it's upon you to think about that. It's also incumbent upon you that if you, in, in your data mapping, if you determine that that information can be put together, you have to report that up through the chain, um, you know, whatever, whatever um, a team you're working on and whatever that structure is, whoever's leading that, you have to be able to uh, bring that up and say, hey, you know, we have a potential uh, um, access for HIPAA here. How, how shall we deal with that? Questions before I go any further? Or I was wondering, because uh, cause I guess like, I know there's some kind of like data thing in California too, like CCPA. Yep. And uh, I guess what I was wondering is like, so if you, I don't know all the ins and outs, but like if you say you work to be GDPR compliant, um, I don't I don't know what do most of the rules that I guess work in CCPA kind of function as a subset of GDPR. So like if you're GDPR compliant, would you expect to also be CCPA compliant or? That, that, is, a, that is a very good question, a very wise question. Um, the answer is no, you should not assume that if you're compliant with one, that you're compliant with the other. They are two distinctly different regulations. And if we take a step back and, and remind GDPR is actually um, designed and bound for European um, uh, members, yeah. EU members of which there's about 17 countries, US is not one of them. California regulation that you're referring to is unique to California, not even, it's not even applicable where I live here in Arizona. But if you think of it mechanically, they are designed to function similar. So in essence, um, what your question is, uh, California decided that because GDPR didn't cover the US, they thought that it was incumbent upon um, them to protect that data at essentially the same level, keyword essentially, that they modeled some of it after GDPR. But now you take um, like where I work in the cybersecurity side and the tool sets that Microsoft in specific provides. We have certain compliance templates that um, when, our, when our customers, city, state, local governments, when they have those particular um, uh, tool sets, they can run compliance reports against HIPAA, against GDPR, and there is one specifically for the California. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a great question. And then, you know, the, the ultimate question for um, is, what do you do about it? Well, the first thing is, if you if you reside in California and you'll be working for an organization there where you're writing data, it is incumbent upon you to actually read those regulations and understand them. Yeah. I will assume, like Microsoft, we provide actual training. Um, we're required, or uh, Microsoft requires us to go through specific training, GDPR, GDPR, HIPAA, and the California ones happen to be part of them. We have to go through certification, usually annually, on all of these. Okay, so Thank great you. question. They are not one and the same, but fundamentally, they, they try to serve the same purpose. Yeah. Okay, anything else or anybody else? Okay, let me touch a little bit about, you know, the actual target of, you know, secure coding and so on. Microsoft, the link on the bottom, and I can provide this uh, after afterwards, um, the link on the bottom, we provide a, um, a whole subsection on our online documentation on writing secure code. Um, and that's called the Secure Coding, uh, coding Guidelines. Um, now this is specific for .NET coding. Um, there are also, you know, for, for Java code and C, um, but, you know, in our, for web-based, most of our stuff is .NET coding. Um, and just, just an as an example of a couple of things that are, that are pointed out in there, these are some of the things that you're going to find in the coding guidelines. They're all going to be defined a lot deeper. I'm not going to get into a, a deep discussion of these for two reasons. One, because I don't write I don't write code. I, I called that out early. I'm not the code writer. So some of these um, I can't get into a whole lot of depth. But what I am pointing out is that 
the guidelines that we provide as written will help you go through those um, and what you would do with that. And there, there's whole sections in there on not just writing secure code, but how you deal with data, how you deal with uh, user information. And uh, I cut out part of it on the bottom there, having to do with how do you, how do you deal with user input um, into, into data? And you know some of the things to take into account. I highlighted a couple of things in blue in there. When you're talking about inputting users' data, because user information can, can contain a lot of various different information, wildcards, um, uh, different types. It could be combinations of username. It could be a, uh, a UPN user uh, principal name. Could be some combinations. A lot of times when, when you're looking at, or uh, when you're porting that information and pushing it into functions and, and data applications, those can actually look like malicious code because of the various different things. It's like, oh wait, this has got a, an uppercase, lowercase, it's got squigglies, it's got ampersands, it's got all sorts of interesting things that I don't know how to parse these. So from your aspect, if you were to go to those guidelines, it calls out about 20 different um, common, out, uh, common things that you're gonna find on a typical user web input that your code would not need to accommodate. Um, you know, so now think things like error checking, think, uh, think things what you, like what you do have to accommodate, but you also have to now put on the bad actor hat. Okay, if I'm a bad actor and I'm going to try to um, break code or I'm going to try to um, uh, break out of, out of the uh, code loop, what, what um, um, characters, what string of characters, what things can I put into an input that can shell me out of that? That's actually one of the biggest way bad actors um, get in and or find vulnerabilities. They discover how they can break an input routine and get around your code. So if they can break it and shell out before that, guess what? Your error checking just went out the window because they're already outside the code routine. Okay, I guarantee this is this is me now talking, and I'm sure you'll be taught this. You want to spend an inordinate inordinate amount of time um, dealing with error checking, error handling as it relates to input, specifically input of user data and um, uh, data on um, web web applications. Okay, so um, Microsoft did something very recently. One of the things we did is we turned off um, to all of our tenants, our tenants in um, our web tenants are called an Azure, um, our cloud is an Azure cloud versus something like Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud, ours is a um, Azure. Um, we just recently, beginning of October, we turned off basic authentication. Um, for a couple of reasons. The primary reason is very straightforward. It's not secure. Um, we call it legacy authentication because a lot of earlier versions of Microsoft apps and third-party apps um, had to use that. If you're, if you're using something like Outlook 2010 or earlier, and God, I hope you're not, but if you're using that, um, it's no longer going to be able to connect because we shut down legacy authentication. It did, um, those versions did not know how to understand what we call modern auth using things like OAuth and SAML and some of the uh, higher code bases. Um, it also couldn't uh, leverage multi-factor authentication. It couldn't trigger MFA. Um, so we shut those down. So in your code writing, the good news is not something you're gonna have to worry about anymore. The bad news is you need to make sure that you understand um, how to write the code securely. One of the ways, or I'm gonna say two of the ways that are very common and are universal are OAuth2 and SAML. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna ask for hands, but this is normally I'd say how many people know what OAuth2 even is. Well, if you didn't, I gave you a definition right there. I, I actually like uh, the way they wrote it, so I copied it directly from DigitalOcean. It's, an, it's authorization. Okay, here's, here's a test. Can somebody define just loosely, what is the difference between um, authorization and authentication?
I'm going to warn you, that's a key concept for application development. You have to know it. Authorization and authentication. What? Nobody's brave enough? Hey, Rich, pick me. Pick me. Oh, me, me, me. All right. So authentication is a process used to identify that the user or the service that is going to access a resource is who they or it says it is. Authentication is that um, creating an authentication token um, that um, happens after, say, a user successfully enters their username, the, the, the correct username password, and or um, gets that is triggered by MFA and they now get an MFA token. So the authentication is saying this is this is um, definitive proof that the user is who they say they are. So when somebody logs in, that is authentication. Just by the fact that somebody logged in successfully, did that give them any access to anything? I'm, I'm hoping the answer is no. You shouldn't by default have any default access to anything of consequence, right? So that's where authentication, come, uh, authorization comes in. Authorization is the next level. Authorization is now that the user has proven and has an authentication um, token, what are they authorized to do? What can they get to? If they get to an application, now we're back to your code writing. Just because they logged in and they can get to their application, do they have uh, full access to everything that your application provides? Does your application provide different levels, granularity of, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> of authorization? Classic case in point, if I go to Salesforce and I log in, um, you know, when I'm an administrator and I create user objects in Salesforce so for users, and then they log into it, I have to assign that user a, a particular level. And I could do that based off their job title, their role, maybe, um, maybe some part of their um, uh, their user object, one of the attributes like a department or, or organization name or even a location of their department. And I then assign them what level of access they should have to that. Are they an application owner? Are they a security reader? Are they an application reader? Are they a, um, um, an application owner where they have the ability to not only take control of the app, but also add people to that application? So authorization is typically done at the application um, level. Authentication is usually done at the, um, uh, the, the domain level, you know, whatever service, the IDP that you're going to be using. So questions on that, first of all, you, you really have to um, hammer that in your brain. You won't get any further in code writing if you don't have a clear definition of those two. I have a question. Yes. Um, how, how does, you know, when you log in with your two-factor verification yeah and now i check a little box that says don't do make me do this every time yes how does that how does that work in the scheme of what you're describing here sure so um a great again great question um from a from the back end meaning um what the administrative um uh when they set up mfa first they have to make that conscious choice are they going to allow that what you're referring to, that checkbox, is the, um, it's called the time to live, the, uh, the, token, the token lifetime is its, its true name. Um, when, you, when you log in, if everybody doesn't know what the term token means as part of uh, code, token is um, when I successfully log in to an application, uh, to a, uh, um, in our case, Azure. I get an authentication um, token, which means that's what's presented to all the applications. So once I've successfully logged in, my username and password isn't passed around everywhere. The, the uh, authentication token is, and it has a certain time to live. It's going to time out after a while. Um, same way when you do MFA, it has a certain time to live. We wouldn't want somebody to um, respond to an MFA challenge, and then that, and then that's good for the next five days. Right. Well, that would be kind of silly. That leaves a huge gap. 
So usually an MFA token is roughly four hours. That's the, the typical default. It is in Microsoft. Um, and as you just asked about, we, we do provide the option to allow users to um, shorten that time frame. You know, basically um, enable that checkbox to say, yes, you know, remember it for this duration, or you maybe can take that checkbox away and, and uh, we, can, we can make that happen every time a user goes to access a new resource. So the first thing is the organization has to determine that. And the next thing is now when the user successfully authenticates through MFA, the system that is doing the authentication, and again, because I work for Microsoft, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on Azure. Azure, um, your user object now has an authentication token and it has an MFA token. So now when I go to an application, if that application or if the resource that I'm accessing um, requires MFA, that token is being passed to it and basically saying, I've already successfully MFA'd. The time to live is four hours. Um, that was uh, 1.5 hours ago. It's still valid. It's going to let you in. It will not challenge you for that MFA again. Um, that can be overridden programmatically. Um, you know, so even the administrators, they can, they can basically, it's called uh, rescinding the token. You can go into a user's object. So like if I want to test, uh, if I'm doing code testing, um, I might test it with MFA. Well, what am I going to do? Sit around and wait for four hours and go, crap, I can't do it again for four hours because it's not going to ask me for it again. No, I can go into the user's object, select that as administrator or account operator. I can select that user's object and say rescind token. And that, and therefore, we're telling the system, ignore that. Um, and now if I, if I go to an object that requires MFA, it's going to require it again. Okay. So the answer is twofold. First is they have to decide whether they're going to allow um, the um, lifetime token to be overridden or what the duration is. And the second thing is um, the users have to uh, successfully do MFA. Um, I think I pointed out earlier that remember MFA only kicks in, only triggers after a um, an individual, be the real individual or a bad actor, has successfully put in the username and password. So MFA itself doesn't protect. That's that's a key thing here. Stomp, stomp, stomp. MFA does not protect user accounts because it won't even trigger until the correct username password has been entered. It protects whatever is going to be that account would be used for either successfully logging into the environment or getting to that next level or getting to your application. Okay, kind of a long answer, but I, I hope that answered what you were asking. Yes, uh, but we do have one other question, may I ask you? Absolutely. Uh, password saving services like Chrome or LastPass, are they good to use or do they, um, do they need additional security protection? Sure. Uh, I personally do use LastPass. Um, so the, the security has everything to do with the application itself. So for instance, I use LastPass. Um, LastPass is protected by the, the, the data store. The key vault that it uses is double hashed. It is protected by AES 256-bit encryption. Um, and that password, first of all, it, it never saves it by default. It always asks me, you know, if I want to save that, there's many of them, like when I'm doing code testing, I never save those passwords, right? Um, and then it's stored locally on my system in an encrypted um, uh, vault, basically. It's a, it's a data store that is encrypted. So as long as it's not accessible um, and easily compromised, um, yes. Now you start talking about other less secure means, you know, uh, be careful. There's, there's a, a, an absolute ton if you go out there onto, you know, um, the Apple store or any of these other places, the Google Play store, um, there's gonna be all sorts of password vaulting apps. Just be careful because, you know, if you think about it, where would be the best place to put a, a, uh, a password Trojan, a virus? Wouldn't it be in the, the virus checking software, likewise, if I wanted to compromise passwords, wouldn't the best place to put it would be in an application that, that's supposed to save passwords? So just make sure you're, you're using one of the major, major ones and that it's, um, uh, it's been validated, uh, verified. 
And if I can offer the Chrome password storage vaults are not very secure. Um, I had a client once who couldn't find her password and I simply went in, I knew where the Chrome passwords were stored. I went and found it and started her account for her. Yep. <laughs> so think about when, if it's that bad actor gets in and can root around in your, your, bat, your computer, uh, yep. if you're just storing things in Chrome or one of the other windows, uh, what that means. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely correct. So I'm going to, uh, I was going to touch it later. I see I've, I'm actually doing, you know, I'm, I'm kind of where I wanted to be on time. Uh, I'm going to sidebar just in case I, I do run. So here's something else that is becoming more and more prevalent and Microsoft is pushing it. It's called passwordless logon. Um, what does passwordless logon mean? Well, We've already determined early on this conversation what is the number one vector for bad actors to, to do something by compromising the user's password. Well, what if I don't have a password? If they can't, if they can't um, uh, compromise my username password combination, I've just shut down a major um, path um, for access. Of course, in order for that to take place, one, the authentication has to be designed to accept that, ours does. Um, and two, it has to be linked with single sign-on. Uh, reminder for everybody, what is single sign-on? Single sign-on is an important concept because single sign-on means in an organization, usually more, more than individual. As an organization, when I sign on to my user object in my organization, in my case, my Azure account, anywhere that that account would be used to then get to something, which is called what? Authorization. So in order for me to get to some service like Office 365, how come when I log in and then I open up my Outlook, how come it doesn't ask me for my username password again? Because that application is written to understand single sign-on using something like SAML. SAML is the number one currently because it, it's industry standard, it's uh, very secure and it, um, it's a uh, token bearer and it supports multiple IDPs, identity providers, and is supported by all the major service providers. So SAML supports single sign-on. So when I log in successfully, I'm never asked for my password anywhere else. So how, does, how do we do it? Well, in a, in a quick nutshell, um, you might have heard of Windows uh, Windows for Business, or uh, sorry, Windows Hello. Well, Windows Hello, if you have the right type of workstation that has a dual camera system, like uh, my Surface does here, it's not a single camera, it's a dual camera because one camera is um, the actual vi video camera, the other one is an infrared camera. So no, you can't put a picture of Rich in front of that and go, ah, that works. No, you're going to have to do the Mission Impossible thing and go yank out my eyeball and put it in front of it. It's actually the um, uh, the infrared camera is looking to make sure you're a real human. Whatever it's looking at, it's got to be a real human. Um, so Windows Hello for Business, when I enroll my device for that and I enroll my biometrics, meaning my face, or if it doesn't support the camera, my fingerprint, if I have the reader, that information is going to be stored in the hardware. This is also a concept for you. In the hardware, you're going to hear a term called TPM, Trusted Platform Module. Your hardware, all the new generation hardware, supports preferably TPM 2.0, at minimum TP, uh, TPM 1.2, but hopefully the newer variant. And what that means is when I register my face or my biometrics on my workstation here in front of me, it is digitized, it is hashed, it is secured, it is then protected through that trusted platform module chip. And now <clears throat> when I do that, I also have a pin because let's face it, we all have bad hair days. We all have bad face days. I got a cold, I have bloodshot eyes and, and I'm wearing my sunglasses. And now the camera says I can't read it. And now I have to put in my pin instead. Well, guess what? Because those all take place locally on this workstation through the TPM chip, when I am authenticated, it is that I get that authentication token. And remember I said, the token does not contain your username password. That token is what I'm using to access all other resources. 
I'm being authenticated, but a password is never used in that string. Because a password is never used in that string, the bad actor has no way to gather that password. They can't compromise it if they don't know it. And I'm going to make a statement here you can believe or not. I do not know what my Microsoft password is. I have one. Um, because in order to have an on-prem Active Directory account, we're required to have a password. We, we require it. Can't have a blank. So I have one, but I have it password vaulted. Where? LastPass. I have it vaulted. Um, I just never use it. I have it because there might be an instance at some point when I'd have to do something with it. But so far, everything we have is single sign-on. That's an important concept to understand that whole password thing. So you, you need to understand tokens and how those tokens of authentication, MFA and authent uh, are gonna be used. And then you have to understand the authentication process. Before I run out of time. So when we compare and contrast, if, if you are not fully versed, uh, if you're a code writer, you really are gonna have to be fully versed on OAuth 2 and SAML. I, I uh, hope slash assume you're being trained on those. If not, you will be. And then the question is, all right, are they the same? Well, no, not really. They do have differences. They can work in conjunction with, with each other. Um, but in the middle statement there, SAML supports both authentication and authorization, while OAuth is only for authorization. So think about that. If you're the code writer, are you responsible for authentication? Mm, I would champion probably not. If you're if you're going to be working for an organization and they're going to be using an enterprise solution like like ours or Okta or something of that nature, it is that format that is going to be doing the authentication. You're going to be primarily responsible for authorization of who you're allowing in but you the application you're writing has to be able to support saml and probably oauth to be able to accept those tokens okay and then on, on the bottom well they're not the same they both have different uses but can they be used together yes they actually can and microsoft our services are set up specifically to accept those um, and so anytime I'm going to be using what we call an enterprise application, again, I'll pick on Salesforce. I actually was gonna shell over and show those, but for some interesting reason, the username combination for the demo environment uh, keeps rejecting this morning. So they might be updating or something that happens. It's a shared environment. They might be uh, updating and have it locked out. Um, when you create an enterprise application, and by that, I mean, you're gonna publish an application for users to get to, so that means you're making a URL available that they can get to it, or you're pushing an application down onto their desktop if it's a managed application. And then you're defining within that application, does it support single sign-on? Yes. What method are you using? Well, if it's supporting single sign-on, is it going to be SAML or OAuth? Anybody want to speak up? I'll assume. 25 of you are all typing in SAML. Good call. Because SAML. Say somebody typed that in. <laughs> yes. They'd be correct. Right. Because SAML is used for the authentication for single sign on. So SAML is SSO. OAuth is for um, protection of the um, um, application. So it's used for authentication, or uh, sorry, uh, authorization. Awesome. Um, let me, I'm going to jump down to a couple of different slides here. Rich, you can, you have basically till 1115. So, um, since you're taking your questions during, you have a little more wiggle room. So don't worry. The next group isn't coming in till about 1115. So okay. Feel free, to, All right, great. So feel free to flow over a bit if you want. This is very interesting stuff. So. Excellent. Well, like I said, I'm trying to thank you. I'm trying to make this interactive and relevant to um, to the students and or let's call it what is their personal life. Right. So let, let's talk about, um, you know, again, now I'm stepping outside the code, the code boundaries. I can't just talk strictly about code because remember, 
code is just one piece. Uh, the applications are just one piece of it. So we have to look at the whole big picture. So if 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 we now put on a cybersecurity hat, which is where I live, right? That's that's what I do. That the overall cybersecurity. How do we defend against attacks? And and realize again, shameless plug. I work for Microsoft, so so I'm not going to point out how my competitors might do something different. That's okay. They you know we all do something slightly different, but we do most of it probably similar. So when I I'm going to talk about specifics of ours. How do we defend against attacks? How do we help our customers do that? Well. First thing is through identity protection, you know, preventing those stolen passwords and, and unprotected identities. Well, we do that in a couple ways. The first one is, I just told you, we're gonna provide the capability for all our services to leverage multi-factor authentication. We're going to monitor those user objects. We're going to look at, um, we apply behavioral analytics, which is pretty darned impressive. Um, we, we apply behavioral analytics. So, so get this now. Remember I said we get trillions of signals every day well we are seeing logins from users across the world everywhere and i'm talking all of our azure tenants i'm talking hotmail i'm, I'm even talking xbox live which by the way is huge don't downplay that that's a huge environment we're looking at all those logins we're looking at the millions and millions and millions of devices that are internet connected Think about your PCs, and I'm talking not just your PCs, but also things like iPhones, iPads, Androids, anything that users might be logging and using um, a, a um, an, in our case, an Azure account, right? So we're getting all those different signals. Um, we do a couple of things. So one, anytime a password is changed, we see that password. Don't freak out. Yes, Microsoft really did see when you change that password, we know what it was. However, it's not mapped to a user. No, we do not know who made that password. Okay, Microsoft, why are you doing that? Well, we're trying to protect you. So one of the things we're doing is anytime a user changes a password um, through one of our systems, right? So if you're in Google, okay, great, we're not seeing that. You're Google, we don't care. Um, but if you're using any of, our, any of our systems and you change a password, we're seeing what that password is or we're seeing what you're attempting to use because we're going to look at that globally. And we are then dynamically building a commonly used password database. No, I can't tell you what's in it. One, because I don't know, and two, we're not going to tell you, right? If you knew what it was, that means the bad actor would know, we're not gonna tell anybody. We don't tell people what we know, we're just telling you that we know it. Um, and we dynamically build a bad uh, a bad password list. So now if you were to try to put in password one, two, three, we're not going to let you. We're actually gonna pop up a message that says, without the organization having to do anything, there's no custom anything you need to do as an organization, we're gonna pop up a thing that says, you need to select a different password. This password um, uh, is commonly, uh, has been commonly identified. We're basically just not even gonna let you do it. And we do that through behavioral analytics. We also build a profile on all users as they're logging in, specifically like in Azure. Every time a user logs in, we're looking at where they're logging in from, what their IP address is, what device they're on, what type of a device it is, what browser they're using, whether that browser is a, uh, um, a Tor browser or not. And again, from a code perspective, think of some of the stuff we're doing for you behind the scenes. And then we're applying behavioral analytics. So. Uh, I do all my demos from here in Phoenix. I'm working here from Phoenix, but I cover 10 states. So if I were to log in today, do my work, close the lid, get on a plane in the morning, tomorrow I'm in San Diego, I power it up, I guarantee I'm now gonna be challenged for MFA, whereas sitting here daily, I don't, you, I don't get challenged for MFA. Why did that happen? Because the behavioral analytics of our system automatically looked at all those logins and says, all right, this is where he usually logs in from these using this object with this device going to these locations. If that's what I'm doing every day, then that's normal. Well, by closing my lid, going to a different location, powering up in San Diego, was that nefarious? Did I do anything wrong? Am I a bad actor? Am I a criminal? Nope. However, our system will pick that up and our system, our system will identify that something has changed. That will be um, automatically listed as a medium risk in our system. Um, that is, that is, um, that allows the system to then perform an action. 
a medium risk in this case, that would be unfamiliar location, unfamiliar IP address, because nothing else changed. Well, um, I've set up my environment so that when that happens, it will automatically trigger a requirement for MFA. So doing nothing else, super important. When we look at defending against, um, you know, the bigger picture, this again, uh, when you think code, uh, code action, missing or disabled security products or patches, all right? Um, you need to ensure that your code, when vulnerabilities are found, that your code is and can be updated and can be patched. And um, uh, if you haven't heard the term, you will hear the term regression testing. Regression testing means you have an application that you've written and you and your team have gone through multiple levels of testing on it. And you're testing it against all the applications um, that it has to interact with, um, maybe in your particular customer environment. Well, we now put a patch out there because we have to fix a security flaw because somebody found a really creative and unique way to get in. Maybe it's not even ours. Maybe it's you know a, a, a fault in a Java code and we now have to accommodate that. Great, but you now have to be part of that team to do regression testing to not only have that applied, but then go back, you have to understand where, and this, let's use that as an example, where is Java code used in your application and now what has to be retested to ensure that that patch that was put out there doesn't break the capabilities. So no, you don't get to sit on your hands when there's security. You're involved in security too. Um, defending against tech, misconfigured or abused applications. Well, in this case, we're gonna take the mis misconfigured applications. When you're writing applications, um, think about the portion where I said doing authorization. Um, if, you, if you write, I'm gonna call it weak code. If you write weak code, then you don't put any granularity in your application. And all users that access your application have the same level of access. Well, I have to assume that that level of access uh, probably is higher than it needs to be for each user, right? Not every user needs God rights in an application. So maybe Jane Smith, she needs to be able to run that application and input data, but by the fact that her having the same level as somebody who truly does administer that app, all she has to know is the routine of where the user database is stored or, or um, she can then go in because she has the rights, she can go in and make changes add access to those? Or what if her user object got compromised, the bad actor now has the ability to go into your application, make changes to that application, add other people, or do ransomware and actually prevent, you know, lock out that data. So when you're writing secure code. Um, I mean, that's like, okay, well, like put, put your best offer in if you think it's great. Muting. Um, when you are when you're writing your best code, always go least privileged access. I don't have a slide in here for that, but I'm calling it out right now. Least privileged access. Ding ding ding. Foot stomp. You need to you need to ensure that the applications provide the level necessary for the user object or or service that it's going to interact with, and no more. Questions there. Super important. And to kind of drive that factor home, you will never, and, and in this case, you take the you up to the, the overall organizational level, you being you, the code writer, your application, and then everything wrapped around it, all the authentication, everything. You will never be 100% secure. We are not 100% secure. You know why we're not 100% secure? Because people have to do things. We can be 100% secure. We can lock everything down so things can only talk to each other. But if we can't interact with them and gather data and pull data and push data and save stuff, it's kind of a useless environment. There's no possible way to be 100% secure. Your goal should be 100%, but it's unachievable. What you need to do is you need to do the due diligence. Um, like if you're responsible for an application, you need to do least privilege uh, access. You need to ensure that you're using secure protocols. You need to ensure that um, logging, 
if you're doing logging as part of that access, that the logging is secured. You need to take into account all the um, regulations for safe and secure data storage. Where is your data being stored? If it's being stored outside the bounds of your application, you need to work with that team on how that data is being protected, right? Bad actor is always going to find that one loophole in there. Maybe it's not your app. But guess what? You're saving You're saving data to a SQL application, and that application um, has incorrect permissions or too wide of permissions, right? So, how do we protect them? Anti malware, absolutely. Least privileged access. Enable MFA. Keep your versioning up to date. Protect your data. This one slide can probably wrap up my whole talk. See, so, yeah, I just. I just worked around an hour and 30 minutes talking about one slide. Um, this is the slide, by the way, that I was talking about. Microsoft, as part of our environment, all these methods um, in the, the, uh, the middle bar, password only, call, SMS, push, um, one-time passcode, OAuth tokens, all the way across, our MFA supports all of them. And as you go from left to right, you can see we get more and more and more secure. How does this um, affect you and your application writing? Well, the first thing is it's more informational. I want you to know I explained how Windows Hello um, works. Um, and I explained why in this case where it says good, where you've got SMS text. Uh, SMS text is that typical, we're going to text you a password, uh, sorry, a passcode, right? I explained to you why that's not better. And then you got things like OAuth tokens. Um, you know, uh, may, maybe you use an OAuth token to be something like an RSA hard token, which member, many people have seen. Right? You need to be aware of all these things. So be a, be a little bit more holistic. Don't don't just focus on oh I only write code. No, you don't. You're part of a bigger system. Right? You're part of a big system. And then I use this is called the kill chain slide. Text a kill chain slide. Well. When I when, and, and these are all Microsoft products, you know the product names there. So I'm not I'm not selling you our products. Um, but but this when I talk to these, this is for me to be able to explain to an organization. All right, great. So you went and implemented some type of technology, whether it's ours or a third party, you know, some other vendor, and you're now protecting against phishing and um, and people clicking on nefarious um, attachments and URL links and going to the wrong or, or improper browsing uh, websites. I mean, great, you did that. Are you secure? No, you, you, um, you protected one vector, one entry point for the bad actor. Great, did that stop the bad actor? They've got nothing but time. They're sitting in there behind a keyboard with Red Bull. They're gonna keep going and going and going. So now you have to be able to uh, work from left to right and go, okay, well, if I protect there, now how do I protect the devices themselves? All right, I have to have something can identify, you know, exploits on the device and map them to when something is uh, um, taking place and using behavioral analytics. Great, well, then we go, well, all right, well, what if, what if the user account is being compromised on-prem before they even get into the cloud and using their, their cloud account. Well, I got to account for that because if they compromise that, the on-prem account before it's synced into the cloud and we're protecting the cloud account, how will I know that's a bad, uh, the bad actor um, has gotten in because I have no visibility to it. So in your case, the only relevance or the relevance to this particular um, uh, slide has everything to do with you got to you got to think outside the the simplistic box of just my application. No, you're just a cog in the wheel. You're an important cog because you're providing if you're writing code, maybe, hey, for all I know, when we're talking code writing. You might be part of Microsoft writing the authentication code and writing, you know, that code um, that will now allow for triggering conditional access for MFA. You need to understand that bigger picture. And if even if you're part of the uh, part of the organization doesn't require it, I highly recommend it. I, 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 I am here to tell you, you want a good paying job for the future? It is in security. It is in securely writing code. It is in being on the security team. It's being able to do what I do and work with customers um, you know, on the holistic security. So it looks like we got about 10 minutes left. This is where I would like to open up to all of you 
This is fair game. I call this stump the chump. Ask any questions you want, either about code writing or just security in general. More than happy to answer them for you. Is I that good? I have one. I always have one. <laughs> you do. So I have Windows 11. Um, Thank you. And uh, it has a little reader for my thumbprint, right? Because I wanted to use that. I thought that would make it more secure. Okay. And I find this true of phones and computers. It doesn't, the thumbprint doesn't work very well. What's causing that? Sure. Um, uh, sure. Give me a definition of doesn't work very well. Are you saying that after you register it and then you go to use it, it, it fails and says can't read it or? Multiple times, in fact. Sometimes, it, it, let's say I try something 10 times, it'll work three and seven times fail. Okay. That to me is the definition of doesn't work very well. Um, I would agree with you. Absolutely. I can, you know, just compare and contrast. I can tell you that the Windows Hello for Business works pretty freaking awesome. I mean, I, I literally just walk up to him and goes, hi, and I'm in. Um, so a couple of things. Um, we we don't natively have built-in fingerprint reading. In other words, we, we support the drivers for those. So the very first thing I have to throw out is it is the, it is the fingerprint reader itself. It's, uh, it's ability to, to read. Um, everybody should be aware that um, fingerprints are unique to pretty much everybody in the world, including think about, you know, maybe you've registered and then all of a sudden you cut your finger and then it heals. Guess what? You got to re-register it because that fingerprint is now changed, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then your fingerprints are unique across your hand, you know, so you're going to have different fingerprints in there. So one of the things I do, in, and this might be useful, um, you might want to register more than one uh, fingerprint and find out if you have a higher success for a particular fingerprint. Um, because most of the time, this is, this is my, I can't answer you directly, but my, my, what I have seen most of the time when I find fingerprint readers fail, it's because when you put your finger on there, you're putting it on at a slightly different angle or a different pressure than when you first registered it. Think of it this way. When you push down, you're flattening your finger out and and it, it changes the dynamics a little bit whereas when you're registering maybe we're holding it on there just a little lighter try registering a couple of different fingers and try a different finger Got um it. i do that by the way i have a biometric safe uh by my my bed i i have a firearm in there and it's biometric and i register more than one finger for that very reason right kind of important i, I by the way i find that face reading is much more it works more effectively the camera I, seems to be better than the fingerprint readers. So yes, I I, I do. And so if you if you were to um, uh, buy a device that says it is Windows Hello um, uh, Windows Hello ready, it means it has the dual camera system. Like I said, when when you turn on the camera, you're seeing just the the video camera, but there's a second camera in there that is um, uh, infrared. Got it. Okay. So that's why just having a, uh, uh, if you if you try to use Windows Hello and you just go buy a, an external camera and put it up on top of your monitor, it's not going to work because it doesn't uh, meet the requirements. What else do we do, have? Um, do most cell phones have the infrared built into it or? or? No, most, uh, uh, most of them do not. They have fingerprint reader built into it. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was all for me. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Doesn't, um, doesn't mean something, don't but Go ahead. Yep, we got it. Go ahead. It's kind of a random question, but uh, it, I guess it's more on the authorization side of things. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I guess you brought up like tokens a little bit, like, and I guess I, I think like session tokens, and like normally, I guess you'd, you'd log in and you have a, a session token like stored in a cookie, and <laughs> you have, I guess that points to like a user in some kind of cache or something. And I was just, so I guess like that's kind of I guess what I think of like as the default behavior, and I guess um, I guess there's like those JSON web tokens, yeah. and I guess the downfall people always say is like uh, I guess you can't expire a token manually, and I was yeah. just wondering like so I, I was just thinking you usually yeah. I guess you would have a JSON web token and then point to a user with like a user ID or something, yeah, and I guess to expire that would something like I guess you could could you just change the user credentials if it's something like sufficiently unique? Um, so like, yeah, um, I, I 
think I understand the question, so I'm going to answer and tell me if I'm I'm close. So first of all, um, mm -hmm. you're correct. Um, the token is a generic word. There's there's multiple tokens that that take place, right? You know, you've got the bearer mm -hmm. token, you've got an MFA um, um, MFA token, you've got an authentication token, and so on, right? So there's different tokens that are being passed. As I stated earlier, our service does support it. In general, the authentication token can be um, can be rescinded as uh, like we, we support um, a rescinding the MFA token, right? Yeah. But the authorization token is much more challenging because that's at the application level. So no, in general, we can't, um, um, uh, we don't have any, you know, data box to be able to, to um, rescind that. So part of what I would answer is depending upon why you're trying to rescind it, um, uh, Maybe that maybe the requirement is then to rescind that uh, uh, authorization, the authentication token. But but that's a bigger picture because that means any app the user tries to um, access, they're going to have to re-authenticate. Yeah. Um, that that's an interesting one, and again, because and and that's a great question because I'm not I I am not uh, part of our development team and I don't write the code. I'm sure there are creative ways to do that, um, mm -hmm. but but. Um, the different you're, you're dealing with tokens and different tokens are handled um, in different methods and provide different capabilities. So I imagine what you just described, there is some method for handling that. I, I apologize short of what I just said. I don't know how you do that. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. But, but yeah, I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at even the flow here, you're looking at various different um, authentication and access tokens uh, being granted. And then we don't even show like in here, you know, the, the uh, follow on MFA to it because usually MFA is happening before you get there. We're not, mm -hmm. in general, a, a well-written um, environment, we're not even going to let you get to the application if you're required to challenge MFA and you, and you don't, you're not successful. Why would we ever take you to the app so you're not even going to, that's not something you typically have to accommodate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Uh, anybody else? I think I'm bumping up on the last two minutes. Um, while you're thinking about it then, so I want to thank you. Uh, uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to uh, speak to you. I hope um, the, the unique security side flair that I brought to this was useful. I, I know it's not strictly about um, the code writing, but a lot of what I was pointing out, you know, uh, will help make you a better um, uh, code writer in the general sense that understanding the bigger picture where applications and or where your services that you're going to deal with fit in there. So thank you very much. Um, and I give it back to um, the team.